in of the things we learn. And most importantly, we pray that may the things we learn spark new and inspire us into many dimensions that will be able to change the nutrition landscape in Ghana and Africa and also the world. We thank you for a wonderful time today. Those the many blessings we ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so whilst we wait for, um, I think we may invite Prof. Anna in about 10, 15 minutes, but in the meantime, I would want to know who is. He's the president of Gant. We would want to invite Dr. Perko to give us a welcome address and also to tell us the reason why we are here today. And in the meantime, as he's coming, I would want to introduce myself. My name is Eunice Berkonate, and I'll be your moderator for today. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Perko. All right. Thank you very much. Uh... Dr. Berko, um, uh, it's, it's, you know. <laughs> it's it's great having having us back uh, to look at this very important issue of uh, sugar sweetened beverages and uh, uh, its consumption and uh, its challenges that it poses to our country. Um, Gand, as you know. Uh, mm -hmm prides itself in ensuring that the uh, Ghana's nutrition environment, food environment is well protected and the citizenry have access to quality and uh, true nutrition information as best that could help drive their health. Uh, this afternoon, as part of uh, its mandate, um, we are hosting yet another important uh, webinar on the subject of uh, sugar sweetened beverages, the nutritional and health implications of the growing consumption of this in Ghana. Um, we have today uh, uh, a very honored person, uh, Professor Reginald Anan, who happens to be my senior at school and uh, a colleague and in many fronts, um, well positioned to give us this message as he has been working very much on this uh, food environment. It's important also that GAN is very interested in this matter as we are part of the coalition uh, that is looking at advocating for health and with its main goal to ensure that Ghana has a safer and more healthier food environment as well as uh, uh, ensuring in, in its bit to ensure that the population's health is protected. Uh, so um, this is much more of not just uh, to sensitize our members on the, on, on the part of the issues of SSB, but also to bring that to the attention of us everywhere that we find ourselves globally. And uh, we look forward uh, to a great presentation. Thanks, uh, Eunice. Uh, and thanks to everyone. On this call, I stand to open the day's webinar uh, on the growing consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. Thanks and welcome all. Over to you, Ernest. means the device is muted. Oh, sorry. So thank you very much, Dr. Preko, and for the warm, warm welcome. And I would also want to inform um, participants that this webinar is organized by GAND in partnership with Advocating for Health, our, our partners in, in this new drive. At this point, I would want to invite uh, Mr. Percy Agodo to give us something short about Gant, then we would invite our honorable speaker for today. So, um, Dela, are you on? Okay, great. Dela is on. So we'll give Dela about 10 minutes to tell us some, something small about Gant. 
Okay, good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, um, seniors, and good afternoon, everyone. Please, can you hear me correctly? Very well. Yes. You can be Very well. The last time I tried to make this presentation, the internet was 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 acting up. I pray that it doesn't repeat itself today. Um, so I am first, and I, my goal here is to talk about Gant and why we are Gant. Um, we need to remind ourselves of, of these things occasionally so that we don't we don't forget where we are coming from and where we are going. So why did we have to start Gant? Actually, the timelines are very instructive. So as far back as 20, 2008, I just finished the investor. I was doing national service at the time. The, the ISCO, which is the International Standard Classification of Occupations, which is a, a body of the international labor organizations, defined all health professions. And this is the document that the WHO uses to, to, to define health professions in, in the world. And they defined nutrition and dietetics with a number, a specific number, which is 2265. So the, the, the number of our profession is 2265. That means it is only one profession. And they named it dietitians and nutritionists. And there's some of the sub um, special uh, classifications under that includes what is listed there. And that was in 2008. By 2012, 2013, Ghana was in the process of, of regulating the practice. Gala, of, are, you, are you going to project your slide or you just, it's, uh, it's, it's, we're not seeing it. You can't see it, oops. Um, let me try that again. We can see. It was projected. It was projected, yes, I thought so. Yeah, it is. Okay, so like I was saying, so in 2012, 2013, the, the, the country or the sovereign state of Ghana decided to regulate health professions. Because at the time, anybody, anywhere, is, a, is, is considers him or herself a professional. So after 2013, you are no longer a professional until you are, you are following the laws that have been set by the country. In other words, before 2013, all of us who, who graduated in, with a degree or any kind of certification in nutrition or dietetics could, call our, could hold ourselves as so. But by 2013, the state put the law, which we call the Allied Health Professions. Sorry, we still can't see the slide. I think it's performance uh, image that is showing. I, I'm yeah. guessing. Yeah. I'm so, also, I also yeah, can see. Yes. So, okay. so, so can can, um, please close um, performance on, and off. then so that the other one can be allowed. Yeah. Oh, okay. So now we may have to let me do a new share then. We can now see. Yes, now we can see. Oh, okay. So I guess there were two shares. Thank it happens sometimes when you have two shares. Forgive me. Yeah. Sorry. So, so, so I was just saying that we now have a law which came into effect in 2013. And so per this law, all of us are supposed to be regulated by what we now call the Allied Health Professions Council. Now, by 2014, um, there about, I mean, or even before then, Nutritionists have their, were, were organized as the Nutrition Association, Ghana Nutrition Association, and dietitians were organized as the Ghana Dietetic Association. And they were still at our, some of our colleagues who were neither in the GNA or the GDA, but they were also in their own I mean, fed, I mean, fellowships and associations. But what happened is that we began to do a number of collaborations. And one of the things that we did around 2014 was to organize and host ANEC in Ghana. Now that was the early signs that we could actually work together. And there was actually no need for us to continue to exist as independent um, bodies. Because like I said, as far back as 20, 2008, the world had already considered us as a group, a unit. Now, so by 2018, we started having, we started the conversations on how to merge the two bodies, the Ghana Nutrition Association and the Ghana Dietetics Association. And what, and, and the earliest, activities that we did was, around, was the um, hosting or co-hosting of the Codex conference, which was held in Ghana. Now, fast forward 2019, we are all aware of, of the inauguration of Ghana in July, on July 2nd. And the key, the guest speaker was the first lady of the Republic of Ghana. That put Ghana on the map. And thereafter, what we have sought to do as an association 
or as a professional body is to build the, the structures and empower our members to, to, to represent the profession everywhere that the, each professional is, exists. And so that's the goal of, our, of, of GAND going forward. And that informs the vision statement and the mission statement. So in our mission, in our vision statement, we want to be the most credible source of nutrition and food information as far as it applies to health and disease in Ghana, the most credible. And our members will be the ones that people will look to when they are thinking nutrition information. Now that informs what, so this, today's um, C, CPD activity and other ones that are going to be held. And our mission statement has been to ensure that our, our members, we create the supportive environment for our members to provide dynamic professional services and respond to the needs of our, of, of our members and the community in Ghana at large. So that is how GAN is, is set up. And that's what we are trying to do. So far, I would like to say that some of the achievements we've had include, and these are not, these are just a few of them, include the fact that we have successfully registered the GAND as the only professional body of nutrition and dietetics in Ghana. And per our laws, which is one of them is the, the Professions Body Registration Act, um, 1973. This is the NRCD 143. There can only be one professional body in Ghana, pretty much like, like the Ghana um, Bar Association and the Ghana Medical Association and the, and, and, and the likes. So these are, these are state-sponsored or state-recognized professional bodies. And so when you think of nutrition and dietetics, you should, the state con naturally goes to Ghana. That's, that's a very important achievement. Beyond that, we've held congresses. We have, we have done some membership improvement programs. We have, including this very one we are hosting, we have done a number of um, strategic positions. We've engaged ourselves in such a way that where there's any discussion on nutrition and policies on nutrition, GAND is recognized. And I have to acknowledge um, some of the people in this meeting, including Prof. Annan, who's our speaker today, and the president, and a few others who, who, have, who have held the banner of, of, of GAN High in some of these meetings. And that is how come we are um, part of this SSB campaign, uh, naturally. Now, these are just a few pictures to show you the things that to remind us of the things we have done in the past. So the, on the top left corner is the first lady in our first ever um, conference. And then um, the bottom corner, the bottom left is um, a picture of the corn, which I'm sure you are aware of. And if you recollect, we had this in the COVID, in the, in the heat of COVID, we had the, the, our team produce info, infographics like the one on the bottom right. And I'm sure many of you came across them and shared them widely to, to help our people or the people of Ghana to communicate nutrition and how to keep um, well nourished in the face of a of an, on, of an ongoing global pandemic. And that was a very good thing. Now, who are our members? Um, who can be a member? Anybody, by, by our constitution, anybody who has at least a diploma, a diploma in nutrition or dietetics qualifies to be a full member. Anybody with anything less than that qualifies as an associate member. But beyond that, they are fellows of GAN, which we are yet to inaugurate one, and they are student members of GAN. The other types of membership. Now, how do you become a member? Very simple, really. You just need to go online, gangonline.org, select um, the button that says become a member and select the right membership for your, for your qualification. And then you go through the process, fill the form, submit it, and then you will get the notification to pay your dues, which is very um, affordable. In fact, it's one of the most affordable dues I've come across in the whole world. Um, then, uh, but I want you to understand that so far, we have not reached everybody who needs to be a member of GAN. We've not reached everybody yet. Um, in, 20, in April 2022, this year, the Allied Health Professions Council published in the, the what we call in the Gazette, um, the list of people in good standing, uh, people who are, who are in the nutrition and the tech space, who are in good standing with the professional council. And these are the numbers. So there are about 700, a little over 700 nutritionists, there's around 360 dietitians, a little about almost 600 technical officers, nutrition technical officers, and the other technician and assistant cadres are just under, under 30. Now, if you put all of that together, we have a minimum of 1,700 plus professionals who ought to be members of GAN. 
And I can say that we have about 90, 99% of the dietitians and we are still chasing after the remaining, uh, we are just around, hanging around about, about 30% of the nutrition group. So we are chasing after the others. Now, but that is even those who are in good standing. And, and you and I know that some people never really got the chance to complete the, the licensing process for, the, for, the, for this year. And so there are still many more people who ought to be on this list who's, who's, who have not been added to the numbers yet. And our goal is to reach out to all of these people so that we can build a body that will seek our welfare together. Now, there are some discussions we will need to have and the way to achieve them is when we have the numbers in, I mean, behind us. And I hope that together we would get this message across to everybody else. Now, I want to say that we have several challenges and most of them are national in character, job recognition and satisfaction. We, you, you, are, you, you are not even getting the job. And when you get the job, other people don't see your, the value of your work. So you have to go beyond your, yourself to, to, to prove yourself and why you are important. That only happens when you don't have a very strong professional, but that does that for you. If, if you have a, like, if you have a body like, I don't like using them for it as examples, but in this case, I'll do that. Like the Ghana Bar Association. If the Ghana Bar Association says A, B, C, D, their members don't need to chase after, after people to, to, to follow them. Because once the association says that, or the professional body has said it as so, everybody else typically would, would naturally follow. And that affects the membership. Now, among that, there are also issues about career progression. So you have finished your program, you have gone on further studies, where do you stand? Do you get a promotion in many facilities in Ghana today? You can go for further studies and, and it, it's, it, you are basically at the behest of, or the, of, of an HR manager to decide whether or not you, you qualify or, or require a promotion. These are some of the challenging problems that um, beset us. And to, the way to solve them is not individually, but it's through the professional body. And then of course, there are standards that are lacking. Last week we spoke, we had the FDA say, you don't even know, have a standard for how much sugar should be in, 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 in sugary drinks. And these are things that the professional body can actually write position statements on, and that guides the, the, the conversations in nutrition and dietetics in the country. Now, for the sake of time, I'll just move on. And I would say that uh, the things that make a professional body includes the fact that you have a supervised professional practice. You have a credentialing system. Now, as we speak, uh, we say RD and we mention the names, but you know, um, fortunately that is guided that in across the globe, every credential is recognized by, by the law. And, and the way to do that is to ensure that it is captured in our laws. We have them, but we have not properly defined them. So somebody who is a nutritionist does not necessarily say I am a registered nutritionist. You will say at best, at current, you will say, I'm a registered, I'm a licensed nutrition because the allied health provides a license. But we can actually go on and provide credentials for our people, which is very missing. And professional socialization is what we are doing. We create opportunities for you to, to learn and to, and, to, and to become a better version of yourself than you previously are. Now there is also autonomy and that, that, and that, and then also there is legal protection. Now I'm sure that in the, in the course of this, present, of this meeting, uh, the Honorable President will, 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 uh, will broker some information to us. And that is where the professional body comes in. Once the professional body has taken a stand or a position on an issue, usually every member is covered by that position because then you can point to that and the professional body takes legal responsibility for you and you have no repercussions coming to you as an individual. And that is how we build professions across the world. Now, um, I like to show this picture just for the purposes of of challenging our minds and averting us to this one thing. Yeah, this is a, a tree that has two branches that is split in the middle. For some people, this is a very bad thing that there's a split in the middle. So then it's a, it, it's, it's, there's a break, you look at the break. But if you look at it carefully, this is a very beautiful picture. A picture where there are two arms to a tree, but then they, they are coexisting together and, and giving the scenery and beautiful ambience. And that is what nutrition and dietetics is. We are two arms of one tree. If we treat ourselves well and we work together, the, the radiance that we will transmit to the people around us can only be, can only be marveled at and cannot be contested. Mind you, we are in, the, we are in a competition for, for recognition, uh, a, a competition for, 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 
um, I want to use the word supremacy advisedly because we know that there are other professionals and other professions that are quickly venturing into nutrition and dietetics because of where the world is going. Global funding is entering nutrition seriously and people have identified that at, at, sometimes we only get to see the crumbs of the funding because we are not on we are not the ones at the on the table around the table making the decisions. In fact, I I want to repeat something that I've heard before. I'll I'll not mention who said it. It says that you are either on the on the menu or at the table. It's either you are you are a guest at the table or you are on the menu. Now we don't want to remain on the menu. We want to be guests around the table who are part of making the decision process. And the way to do that is to blend our beauty together and and achieve that together. Um. So that is why in Gand, our vision for the next few years is to get to the point where we can credential each member as a registered dietitian nutritionist with specialties in different specialties. You don't need, you don't need to be a, a jack of all trades. You can be a specialist, just like other professions have it. And the way to do that is to look at our, our curriculum, to look at our, our um, colleges, awarding, uh, specialty awarding colleges and, and things like that. And these are conversations that over time we would come to, to have and we will come to a conclusion on. But just to share that this is what an RDA means. As far back as 2014, the International Confederation of Dietetic Associations defined that as a professional who applies the science of food and nutrition to promote health, prevent and treat disease, to optimize the health of individuals, groups, communities, and populations. What we do is at both the preventive end and the curative end. Some of us are mostly at the preventive end. Others are mostly at the, at the creative end. Some are actually in, in the middle, somewhere in the continuum. We want to make it possible for all of us to have that credentialing that makes us meet this definition and, and, and represent it so. And that's why the GAN strategy is a seven step strategy, which we have shared with you in the past. By 2025, we want to be able to achieve GAN autonomy. We want to be able to have a very good governing structure. And we want to be able to provide the, the professional visibility that will make that will be beneficial to you so that when wherever you are you don't need to mention your name or to, to say i have a phd or I, or I, or a master's in nutrition you just need to say i'm a member of gant and that is enough to, to open doors for you that is where we are going and then um, on that note i want to say thank you for listening to me have a blessed day enjoy the, the rest thank of the you <laughs> Thank you very, very much, um, Mr. Tessiagodo. And um, I've picked one or two things. I'm sure my colleagues have also picked more. And one of the things I picked was, it's either you're on the menu or you are at the table. So thank you very much. It really felt like the state of Gant address. So at this point, I would say my fellow nutritionists and dietitians, I would love to invite an honorable person who will be taking us through an interesting topic. His name is Professor Reginald Annan, who he is an associate professor at the Department of Biotechnology, KNUST. He has over 20 years of experience working in various areas of nutrition, lecturing, research, nutrition programs, and also project management. In this case, he's very deep, very wide, and very high up there actually encompasses building capacity for prevention and treatment of acute malnutrition in infants and young children. He's actually well known for one of his key research, which is obesogenic and unhealthy food environment and food systems through empirical research and address these to public health policy. Uh, as well as providing us insights on epidemiological of nutrition related NCDs and interventions to prevent and also to manage them. Like I said, Prof is very deep. So today we are really fortunate. Aside this, all these that he does, he's also has consulted for FAO and also UNICEF, MST, IAEA, CIMAM, and a whole host of others on various nutrition projects and programs. He has also served on several expert committees in Ghana, Africa, and also globally, such as FANUS, the Federation of African Nutrition Societies, and also E-Nutrition Academy, and the World of Public Health Association. 
He is currently the of the nutrition group of Ghana. This topic, the topic for today is the nutritional health implication of the growing consumption of sugar sweetened beverages in Ghana. So, Prof, today we really, really are privileged to have you. I'll kindly hand you over to our wonderful members and I'll come in later during the Q&A session at about, say, 5.30. So thank you very much. And if there are questions, can you put them in the chat box as well? Thank you very much. Then, Prof, please, over to you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and all the good things you have said. <laughs> and I'm also very grateful to even be invited to speak today on this important topic. I'm trying to um, put on my, if I can see myself, great. And also to share, I'm sharing with you, I want to put it on. Full slide mode so that it can show. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Eunice. Um, well, so today's topic is um, the nutritional and health implications of increasing SSB consumption in Ghana. But I removed the Ghana from it because I mean the nutritional implications of um, consumption of um, SSB, um, which is on the high. It's, it's global, and, and the same effect you have on Ghanaians, uh, it will also have on the rest of the world. And, and of course, I've, put, I've also picked the, the evidence from various comments of the world. So this really reflects what will happen to the whole world if we continue to consume SSBs the way they are being consumed. And so there's an, a whole array of them, different colors and different bottles that we see them on the market. Um, and I've shown them in this picture. And I also understand that this is um, this will end some CPD points, and because of that, um, it would be a bit more technical. And because we all expected to be people in the field of nutrition and dietetics, and so um, we need a meet um, of the evidence in order to you know transmit it when the, the need arises. And so today's um, presentation's outline, is what is shown here, I would like us to understand when we talk about SSBs, we are interested in the other, uh, the other arm of malnutrition, which is, I don't want to say overnutrition, but I will say overweight and obesity, and the issues that are related to overweight and obesity, which are generally the non-communicable diseases. So I would like us to really look into the bedding of obesity and NCDs as we have them currently globally and narrowing down to Ghana. And then to also understand the drivers of malnutrition, in this case, um, overweight and, and NCDs in, in Ghana, then we'll narrow it down to what SSBs are and see whether um, they are really related to, to the health impact of what they are supposed to cause, which is the NCDs that everybody is talking about, based on the evidence that we, we have. And of course, we'd like to also know about the composition of the SSDs and how the mechanisms by which they affect health and the evidence out there relating to um, um, whether they actually affect the health of individuals or people from various studies. And of course, we'll end with some conclusion. So um, what are NCDs? It's something we, the word uh, is a terminology we use all the time, but I want us to know that they are diseases or conditions that affect uh, people or individuals over an extended period of time. And basically, so basically means that they, are, they, uh, they, they occur over a long period of time or they are chronic, for which there are no known positive agents. So they are not caused by infections and they are not transmitted from one person to the other. And the scope includes uh, various diseases, cardiovascular diseases, some cancers, chronic respiratory diseases, diabetes, and others. And of course, I've narrowed down to the top ones there because you will see that the evidence shows that they are the main NCDs that we have globally and also in the country. 
It is sad to know that of all NCD debts, 77% are in low and middle income counties. So they are, they are occurring mainly in countries like Ghana and many others in Africa and the developing world of Southeast Asia. I want us to look at the global top 10 causes of deaths. Now you will see that as of 2019, the first three top 10 causes of death globally are all non-communicable diseases. So ischemic heart disease, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And then, but if you also look at them again, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven of the top 10 causes of deaths globally are non-communicable diseases. So really the burden of non-communicable diseases cannot be overemphasized and something that we must be talking about across the world. And if you look at the numbers, if you put these numbers together, you see that they are way in the millions of people that are affected by um, NCDs. When we narrow it down to the effect of NCDs, we know from WHO that NCDs contribute or kill 41 million people every year. And this is equivalent to 74% of all deaths globally. This actually means that three quarters of all the deaths that are occurring every year globally are as a result of NCDs. What also that means is that if we get rid of NCDs, we are actually getting rid of 75% of all the deaths. What also that means that if we eradicate NCDs, of course, it cannot be by if we were to eradicate NCDs, it means that 75% of the deaths that are occurring in the world will be averted. Now, each year, 17 million people die from NCD below the age of 70. So basically what that means also is that NCDs are associated with premature death. They are not just causing most of the deaths globally, but they are also associated with premature deaths. These are deaths that are occurring before people's time of 70, which means that without NCDs, people are living much more beyond 70 years of age. And unfortunately, again, 86% of these 17 million deaths, premature deaths are occurring in, in low and middle income countries like Ghana. So it is our problem. Now, when you take these deaths, you will see that the top, the top four causes of these deaths are cardiovascular diseases, cancers, chronic respiratory diseases, and diabetes. Now, cardiovascular diseases alone account for 17.9 million of, people, of deaths annually, globally. 9.3 million from cancers, 4.1 million from chronic respiratory diseases, and 2 million um, from diabetes, and then um, including kidney disease deaths that are caused by diabetes. And these four deaths, these four causes, or these four NCDs account for 8% of all the NCD deaths. So of course, NCDs are already responsible for 75% of global deaths, but of the NCDs, four of them are associated with 80% of the deaths. So we can clearly prioritize and know where policy action should focus in order to, um, to reduce uh, the, the, the burden of NCDs, which are the deaths that are associated with them. Just to reiterate the fact that low and middle income countries are hardest hit by NCDs, I want to show you this, this um, graph that is beautifully provided. It was way back in 2010. Um, and the source is Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, Global Burden of Disease Study 2010 which when you look at the graph, you see clearly that low-income countries are definitely, well, well, let me put it simply, the, the lower the income of a country, the higher the deaths caused by NCDs. So low-income countries have more NCD deaths, followed by um, um, low-middle-income country where, countries where Ghana uh, falls below um, under. Then we have the upper middle income countries. But when you look at high income countries, then you see that the deaths are much, much, much lower. And so what that means is that truly, truly low and middle income countries where Ghana fall are the ones that are hardest hit by NCDs. And then the direct um, 
the consequences, which are the deaths that are associated with it. The evidence is clear for us to see. Put it, I'm putting it in a different way again. Look at this uh, um, diagram that is showing the trend over the years. Then you can see that um, the top um, red graphs are showing low income countries and low middle income countries. Now, of 36 low income countries between 1990, and this data was shown for 2014. So, from 2014, where the, the continuous line ends, and then the dotted lines, which are showing the projections into the future, you can see that it's actually increasing and increasing and increasing. And the same projection is, is for the low middle income countries. So in fact, both low and low middle income countries are the ones that are, are actually at the blunt end of NCDs. When you look at the middle, upper middle and high income countries, you see a reverse trend that sometime in the 90s or below before the 90s, they had higher prevalence, but they are actually increasing in 2010 down the line, they have been increasing and it's projected that beyond 2020 to all the way to 2030, they are about, they're actually almost getting rid of NCDs in the, in the society. It is a worry that we might be worried about. Bringing it down to Ghana, so I presented this earlier on um, in the, when we had the, the Ghana Public Health Association meeting, just to show that in Ghana, we, we report of a double burden of malnutrition. And so we are not talking this today to say that undernutrition is not an issue again. We have a double burden. So NCDs are there, but undernutrition is also there. And we still want to do something about that. Because when you look at the graph to the left, you can see these are coming from the demographic and health service up to 2014, of course, I've not updated this graph with the 2017 and 20, I think 2017 or 2018, where, when it's now tend to make a multiple indicator cluster surveys, where the data, um, more data are. But you can see that stunting, wasting, underweight, which are all indicators for undernutrition, pervade in the, in the society. We see some in, uh, reducing trends but the prevalence levels or proportions or indicate high levels compared to other countries or especially comparing the high, middle, high income countries and, and that of Ghana. But we also see the green line which shows overweight in children on the right. So undernutrition remains a problem, but overweight in children is on the right. Now on the right, I show you overweight in adults, overweight and obesity in adults where you see a sharp rise between 1993, which are all the demographic and health surveys to 2014. And in 2016 and 2018, I've shown you um, graph uh, data from studies. So they are not um, national studies, but they are studies that we can use to give us an impression of what is going on. But you see that the line is increasing. It's, fall, it's almost like if it's forward ever, backward never. So this is a clear picture of the double pol the double malnutrition burden we're talking about. Within the same population, you have children who are undernourished and children who are overweight and obese. And you have adults who are overweight and obese and have not shown the uh, anemia prevalence, but you can also see within the same adult who is overweight and obese, it's likely to also be anemic. So really a double burden of malnutrition pervades in, in the country. And this graph is just also to show us that it is not only in urban areas. Overweight and obesity is high in both urban and rural areas. Even though slightly higher in urban areas, our roughly study showed that rural areas are also as high, not the, to the level of the urban area, but they are comparable. And so we are not dealing with a problem that is only you know, narrowed and in, in urban areas, but also in rural areas. Now, when we come to adult males and females, the prevalence of overweight and obesity is higher in females than males, but we would not say that it's completely non-existent in males. 
it's, it's still appreciable. So really, it's a problem that pervades in the society, both by gender and both by uh, location, and needs to look at what that means that the drivers of overweight and obesity um, are prevailing both in rural areas and urban areas and both in males and in females. I'm going to show you some NCD trends in Ghana as well. So the national policy for the prevention of NCDs that was written, I think in 2011 or 2012, said that in 2003, CVDs accounted for 8.9% of institutional deaths. And this was lower than malaria that um, accounted for 17.1% of deaths. But by 2008, so that's way back 2008, CVDs had overcome malaria, contributing or accounting for 14.5% of institutional deaths compared to 13.4% of deaths that were accounted for by malaria. So actually, when you talk about the need to change our emphasis, it is very true because the NCDs um, have actually overtaken the non um, the, the communicable diseases in terms of the causes of death in the country. And that is way back in 20, 2008. But then the global estimates, the WHO estimates for Ghana um, shows in 2016, but before I talk about it, let me mention that in 2016, the Ministry of Health um, also did a global bedding of disease study in Ghana, and they reported a surge in NCDs. So that's, that's from 2008, 2016, it's eight years down the line. We are reporting a surge. What that means is that there is no more, not just overtaking communicable diseases in 2008, but there's a surge in the NCDs in 2016. And that is actually six years ago, and that should tell you what the picture will look like now if we are to do repeat such studies. And NCDs become, have become the leading causes of disability adjusted life years in the country. So disability adjusted life years refer to the amount of life years that somebody loses, and that is estimated uh, as a result of the disability caused by a condition they have. So the condition of being, you know, that having diabetes or having a, a hypertension and the effect of that, of that disability in your productivity is estimated. And NCDs have become the second for the whole country. That's in 2016 from MOH. And then the GDAHS in 2014 estimated hypertension um, to be about 13% in 15 to 49 years old, but more than 50% in seven, certain sections of the population. So it means that if you pick an overall value of the prevalence in the whole country, it gives you a wrong picture because some sections of the population have extremely high levels that really require urgent action. And the WHO estimates for 2016 reported that 94,000 deaths from NCDs in Ghana and occurred. And the risk of premature death from an NCD was 21%. So if you are among, if you take 100 people of Ghana, 100 Ghanaians, 21, your risk of dying from a premature death is 21%. And if you have to take it by, let's say, 20, 20, 100 people, that's 21 people out of that 100. And that's a WHO estimate for hypertension was 34% in men and 51% in women in urban Ghana as of 2016. So clearly, the NCD is not just global. It's not just low and middle income country when we say, okay, where Ghana for? But when you come down to Ghana itself, then you see that the problem also is um, dire. Now let's understand um, a few issues around what leads to disease in the population so that we understand why there's a need to look at this. Now we know that there are already always um, downstream factors which are related to um, the biological um, the, the predisposition of a person or the person's individual behavior. But also there are also upstream factors like societal and structural um, environments that people find themselves 
that increases their risk for disease. And so when you see this diagram that was drawn from the Western Cape Bearing of Disease Project in 2007, the 2007, they reported the need to understand that when you have these diseases, it's not only because somebody has a biological predisposition or the person has chosen to do the wrong things, but they are also upstream societal and structural um, environment people find themselves that make them unable to control what they have access to and what they consume, which may be the reason why they have diseases. And so with this in mind, now let's look at what the picture says. So the WHO says that tobacco use, physical inactivity, harmful use of alcohol, and unhealthy diets all increase the risk of dying from an NCD. So the NCD deaths that we reported earlier on as estimated from WHO, they go on to talk about the four main uh, risk factors or four main causes of the death, physical inactivity, harmful use of alcohol, unhealthy diets, and, 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 and then tobacco use. Now, when you bring down that to Ghana, we can see the issue around urbanization and modernization of our lifestyles, um, which have created a certain environment which make people behave in a certain way. So I use this picture to show you what people used to do where, when people used to walk long distances to go for their livelihoods and also long distances to get their food. And in, in and, and the kinds of food that they got to, you can see are fresh food from their farms that are likely to be healthy. Now compare that to the picture below where people now for their own livelihoods are likely to not walk and to engage in um, transportation short for short distances. But at the same time, they also don't have to travel to fetch their food. And the food they go to um, access um, are the kinds of unhealthy food that we now see in the environment and the many SSBs that we see in the environment. And somebody will ask, okay, it's in the environment. Are people consuming them? I'm coming to show you that truly it's being consumed. So Popkin in 1993, way back in 1993, encapsulated this uh, phenomenon as the nutrition transition, which is the changing um, nature of food that we are being consumed from energy, low energy dense foods to high energy, low fiber, micronutrient poor foods with low physical activity. And this is what the nutrition, tra the nutrition transition that was postulated in 1993. And this is what clearly on the right, we all can see that prevail, pervades in, in, the, in the country. So we can see nutrition transition and we and, and Popkin explained the, 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 the drivers, urbanization, modernization of food systems and changes in food systems change and um, in food systems. Then we can see that also in our country that there's um, the changing lifestyles, the changing food systems, the modernization, the urbanization and the access to unhealthy food that people can always consume. So the national NCD policy in 2022 have set out strategic areas for addressing the NCDs. And so as a country, we have a plan. There are many strategic areas that they've addressed, but like some of the one areas I mentioned, tobacco use, the smoking, and they've mentioned them but they've also mentioned diet and nutrition. In that document, they say that for diet and nutrition, they want to promote, the country must promote optimal nutrition and health and promote healthy dietary choices and promote food labeling or regulate, ensure food labeling and then regulate the promotion, sale and advertisement of unhealthy foods. And they specifically mention sugar sweetened beverages, saturated uh, fatty acids, and trans uh, fats. Foods that contain these must be regulated. 
um, by their sale, their, their advice, their advertisement, their promotion. Now, what that means is that the country can see the need to do something about the food environment or um, to do something that will make people have access or make healthy dietary choices. How to do that is what we are trying to provoke, talking about taxation with regards to SSBs. And I'm coming to narrow down to that. But going on still on the food environment, we can see that the food environment is obesogenic because of how different foods um, are even costed. So affordability. So for instance, if you look at the cost of water, it is, it, is, it is similar to cost of certain sugary drinks and sometimes more expensive. So what that means is that there's an environment that promotes people going for SSBs. Because in the person's mind, once something contains something, it is food. And once something that didn't contain it is not food. So water is not food. So what that means is that to choose water over a soft drink or a carbonated drink, when water is the same price or higher, it may be a dilemma for people. And we can see pictures of people who are morbidly obese also showing that the country's food environment is obesogenic. So now what are sugar sweetened beverages? Sugar sweetened beverages are generally sugary drinks. They are defined as non-alcoholic beverages with added sugar. And the added sugar can be any kind of sugar but they contain calories. So once they contain calories, they are um, added sugar. But sometimes so they are calorie containing sweetness that are added. So you can still um, add the sugar. These sugar, sugar sweetened beverages or sugary drinks are energy dense because they provide a lot of energy for almost no other nutrients. They are low in fiber because by the way they are processed, or manufactured, the fiber is completely lost. And they don't have micronutrients because in many cases, even for the fruit juices, you will see that it's a small amount of the juice with added water and then sugar. Now, some try to provide different options. So nowadays you may see um, vitamin drinks so, so that the my poor micronutrient issue is being addressed, but the fact is that they are still high in um, sugars. That makes them sugary drinks. Now to, I want us to be aware that there are also those that appear as if they don't have anything. And so like the sports drinks that come as if they are water, but sugars have been added. And then the energy, energy drinks that are giving the name as if, okay, they promote energy, they give you energy, but actually, Apart from the caffeine, they also have a lot of sugars. Now, some also come as teas and coffee. So maybe you like coffee. So you think that, oh, I'm, I'm drinking iced coffee that I've bought um, in, the, in the box that I can put in the fridge. But sugars have been added way beyond the sugar content of when you make your own tea or coffee at home. So these are all considered um, sugar, uh, sugar sweetened beverages or sugary drinks, including even the juice powders where you pick by the powder and you add the water yourself at home and drink. They are all sugary drinks or sugar content sweetened beverage. I want us not to just focus on sodas because there are so many, there are an array of them. And if we don't take care, we will be narrowing down to the ones that we know about, but there are so many of them that are still posing health risks to the population that we must be addressing. And even though they may not mention in the, even when they are labeled, they may not mention sugar. They may be there, they are replaces or let me say some other components that are all sugary. So they may mention them in the ingredient that there's a galactose or corn syrup or brown sugar or brown rice syrup or fruit nectar and so on and so forth. Basically, these are all highly um, dense sugars. 
And uh, you can see that the danger is their high voltage, whichever way you look at it. They may come without, in a certain form, in a certain name, to give you the impression that they are not sugars, that they are actually sugars. Are Ghanaians actually consuming excess <laughs> I would say the answer is yes. And in this graph that I'm showing you, it is um, from our re research in the obesogenic food environment study that we conducted in 2018, where we assessed the foods that were being consumed and we grouped them into the ones that were obesogenic and the ones that were protective. And we found that there were four main obesogenic foods that were being consumed, bread as in white bread, sugar as in sugar itself, sugar sweetened beverages and confectionery. And the four protective foods were the fruit, fish foods, cooked fruit, vegetables, and fresh vegetables. Now, when you pick, look at the, the picture on the left, the pie chart on the left, only 15% of Ghanaians from that study that we had 600 people, only 15% were, were not consuming the obesogenic foods, but consuming the key protective foods. Now, there were some of them who consumed, they were not, they were consuming a lot of the obesogenic food, but they were also consuming the protective food. So almost as if they, they are not nullifying the protectiveness of the protective foods. But, and a lot of people are, were consuming a mix of either high of this and low of this, low of this and high of this. But to find those who were not consuming obesogenic foods, as the ones, the four, the four names up there, were only 15% of the Ghanaian population. So if you ask me, and even though this one, we didn't just narrow the amount of SSB consumed, you, we can clearly say that Ghanaians are consuming SSBs among, so if you, at least if you pick the four key obesogenic foods being consumed, SSB is among them in the country. Why should we be concerned with SSBs? Number one, they are ultra processed foods. They are high in sugars. They are associated with the rising obesity prevalence. They, and we know obesity is a risk factor for NCDs. And that also means that SSBs increase risk for obesity, which increase risk for NCDs. And this is why we must be concerned. And I'm going to the next few slides that I left. I'll just show you the evidence around these. Um, Assertion that I'm making. They are high, they are ultra processed, high in sugars, um, are associated with a rising prevalence of obesity. And we know obesity is a risk factor for NCDs. Therefore, SSBs increase risk for obesity, which increase risk for NCDs. Why are they high? Um, why are they ultra processed? So that's the first thing. Let me just show you by this graph. This is the this graph shows the NOVA classification of foods according to levels of processing. And by this classification, SSBs are the, if you think of the highest processed foods are the chips, followed by fried, the fried potatoes, and then followed by SSBs. So SSBs are considered ultra processed foods. What are ultra processed foods? They are defined as foods um, made from multi-ingredient industrial formulations that include SSPs, packaged breads, and so on and so forth. And what can tell you that a food is ultra processed is that you cannot tell the product, the final product from the raw ingredient from which it is made. Of course, if you look at SSPs, you can't tell um, the product from the ingredient it is um, made from. Now, SSBs are high in sugar. It is known that when you pick one cube of sugar, it's, often, it's equal to four grams. Um, so one cube of sugar is four grams. If you pick one teaspoon of sugar, it gives, you, it gives you five grams. If you pick a typical 354 meal, so just about one bottle of the normal soda that we know, I don't want to mention any name, they can contain as much as 39 grams of sugar or more than 90 spoons of sugar. So you see, when you even, even if you are a sugar lover and you are drinking, making the coffee at home or tea, you may put two or three. If you don't like, you can put half a teaspoon. But when you drink one soda, 
you are drinking 90 spirit, and that is the normal small size that we know about. That people drink sometimes three, four, five. And that 39 grams is equivalent to 156 kilocalories. We, are, we know that, and an evidence shows that some flavored sodas contain as much as 46 grams for that same uh, 12 or 12 ounce or 354 meal. So they are really, really, really high in sugars. What are the recommendations for sugar as part of our daily energy requirement? For children under two years of age, no other sugar should be given to them. For children two to 18 years of age, it should be less than 24 grams or six teaspoons. For adult women, it should be 24 grams or equivalent to six teaspoons. And for adult men, it should be 36 grams or equivalent to nine teaspoons. And if you go up there, you can see that what that means is that when you drink just one 350 meal, you have done, uh, and which is about um, nine teaspoons, you have already drank almost close to twice your total added sugar requirement for the day. And I know your added sugar is going to come from so many other sources. So at the end, and if people drink one or two or three and all that, so you can imagine how much they are going beyond the recommendations for sugar. So now let me also give you some of the other SSBs and the sugar contents. So cola or colas, cola drinks, they have as much as 15 cubes or the four grams times 15. And some of the sweet teas have about eight. Some of the sports water that looks just like water, they have about nine. Nine of the four grams. The energy drinks, some of them have as much as seven. And then when you pick some of the squashes, the one that you buy and you dilute, they have even much, much more. And then some of these other um, ones that um, drinks that are in cups that people buy, they may have unlimited amounts of sugar. You can see clearly that these drinks all outweigh or are far above the recommendations for other sugars that people should have in the day. The evidence also shows that if you drink one 600 ml SSB a day for a year, you'll be drinking almost 23 kilos of sugar in a year. That's about half the 25 kilo rice that people buy. So what that means, again, how hidden the sugar is. Because for somebody who drinks this and not even put sugar in something else, they may tell themselves that I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't eat sugar, I don't use sugar. But actually, in a year, they may have consumed a sack of sugar in the hidden form that they cannot even tell. Let me put this into a better approximation. It is known that approximately 11% of the calories you've consumed come from SSBs. Let's put that aside. To burn off calories from just the 350 new SSB that I showed earlier on, a child must bicycle vigorously for about 30 minutes. And an adult must walk mod at moderate pace for 25 minutes. And that is just for one. And, and so if somebody drinks more than that, and then, like I said, people's um, other sugar coming from different sources at the end of the day they would have eaten so much sugar that it is almost impossible for them to burn them out now there's there's data that shows directly that ssbs cause heart diseases and i showed this earlier on in the other meeting in a big study among four, over forty-two thousand caucasian men adults 40 to 75 years of age, where they measure different serum lipids and proteins that are indicative of heart disease. And they controlled for other confounded, confounded like smoking, physical inactivity, alcohol, the other causes. They showed still that when you control for all these other causes, men who drank the game, this four ounce, a can of SSB, they had 20% increased risk of heart disease and um, heart disease. So clearly, we can say that SSVs are risk factors for heart diseases. But the studies have also show that ultra processed foods in overall, generally, are also uh, associated with health harms or heart diseases. And, and here, 
the, because we know that SSDs are ultra processed food, we can say that people who consume SSDs indirectly have um, are associated with health harm. So let me show you what these studies show. And, and I brought this because, because we are all technical people so that you can actually see and the, 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 the bare facts or the evidence. So in the first study where they looked at association between consumption of consumption of ultra processed food and all cause mortality. It was a sun perspective study. And, and these studies are, are uh, I would say the authoritative because of the level of the, the number of participants that they use. So this study, they, for this study, they evaluated association between consumption of ultra processed foods and all cause mortality. So not mortality from particular disease, but they just showed that among or close to 20,000 participants and um, that they followed, for 20, uh, between 80, 20 to 91 years, followed for two years of age. They showed that, and they accessed, let me uh, give you a little background, they assessed food and drink consumption. And they classified the consumption of the food and drink by the degree of processing, using the NOVA classification that I mentioned earlier on and showed you the examples. And, and they evaluated consumption of these in, in the validated 136 item food frequency questionnaire. And they measured association between consumption of energy adjusted ultra processed foods into different categories. So those that consume low, low, medium, medium, high, and high consumption, and how it was associated with mortality. And they showed that those that consumed participants in the highest quarter of consumption, so that will be the high consumption, <coughs> sorry, had an increased hazard ratio. So we will call this in epidemiology, this also risk ratio or relative risk. Or if you were doing case control studies, you say odds ratio. They had an increased hazard ratio for, develop, for, for dying, for dying from any cause compared to those that were in the other levels of consumption. And they said there was a significant dose response rate relation. What that means is that as the dose increases, as the consumption increases, the hazard ratio was also increasing. And they, they depicted this as for each additional serving of ultra processed food, all cause mortality increased by 18%. So it means that even if I am a high consumption, I have a certain level of um, risk, uh, hazard ratio or risk related risk. But if I increase my consumption, this risk was increasing. So it's almost like an exponential increase. There's no saturated point or a plateau, but like a, a pure linear increase where the higher the consumption, the higher the risk of uh, mortality. Let me show you that second, the second study again, then we'll be wrapping up. So the second study looked at ultra processed food intake and risk of cardiovascular disease. So here, they focus on not all cause mortality, but risk of developing a heart disease. And this is the Nutrinet Sante study that was conducted in France in between 2009 to 18. And again, this is an authoritative study because of the size. I mean, I mean we are doing studies of 700 people, 600 people. These are studies of 10,000 people. So it shows you really how authoritative they are. And of course, we will have to show these because there's, we don't have money to do any of these in Ghana. And nobody is giving anybody money to even replicate this to show whether the same risk pervades in our country. So we have to follow this. But in that study, among in France, of 105,000, over 105,000 adults, um, and they use the same NOVA classification to assess the intake of processed food, food by the level of processing. And they followed them up for five to two years. They also showed that those that um, intake of ultra processed food was associated with a higher risk of overall cardiovascular disease. And I've shown, I've just highlighted the path that you should look at. So we are scientists, we also know that p values are important, confidence intervals are important, and, and quantum or uh, magnitude of the, the risk is also, is also important. And these are all shown in this. And of course, I will expect that you will have access to this and to look at the study yourself and read the full 
but these are just the abstract that I've shown. But they concluded that a higher consumption, consumption of ultra processed foods was associated with a higher risk of cardiovascular, coronary heart, and cerebrovascular diseases. The evidence is clear to show that SSBs and the ultra processed foods cause um, NCDs. But now we also know that SSBs cause NCDs through other um, diseases. So um, WHO says that there are metabolic risk factors contribute to four key metabolic changes that increase the risk of NCDs. So SSBs increases risk for raised blood pressure, overweight and obesity, hyperglycemia and hyperlipidemia, and these all increase the risk for NCDs. Because we already know nutritionists and dietitians, we know raised blood pressure um, is, um, means that a person is on his way to developing some other NCDs, or an overweight obesity means that the person has a risk for NCDs. Hyperglycemia and hyperlipidemia are all risk factors uh, for NCD. We can we call them cardiometabolic risk factors. And they are showing that SSVs increase risk mm -hmm. for these things. And therefore, um, increase, these things also increase risk for NCDs. And let me give you how that picture looks like, and then we'll just the getting uh, the presentation to an end. So how does this, we know that sugar um, is associated with advanced glycated um, end products. So what that, how, how does this happen is that excess sugar combined with protein and fat to form advanced glycated end products which are linked with inflammation. These are um, advanced glycated end products are linked with inflammation, oxidative stress, and heart disease. And so I've shown you a little by uh, that, uh, the pictorial um, relationship over there for those that are interested in um, biochemistry, how this happens. So um, excess sugar with proteins and then lipids can, through the shape space, and amatory product lead to uh, these other metabolites that end up as advanced glycated end products, which increase their advanced glycated end products, increase the risk for inflammation, oxidative stress. And we know how inflammation and oxidative stress um, are associated with atherosclerosis and then um, heart diseases. So sugar can cause heart diseases through the mechanism. We also know that excess sugar inhibits nitric oxide production. So what is the role of nitric oxide? Nitric oxide promotes um, vasodilation. So nitric oxide levels in serum promote vasodilation. Now, excess um, sugar in the form of fructose is known to increase or raise the level of uric acid in the blood. And this inhibits the production of nitric oxide in blood vessels. In the absence of nit nitric oxide, or oxide, there's increased vasoconstriction. And we know how vasoconstriction means that the lumen of the vessels are narrowing and that can result in high uh, blood pressure and then lead to other um, complications. The other way that sugar promotes um, um, blood pressure, increases blood pressure is through what is known as salt sensitive high blood pressure. So for people, there are some individuals who are who have salt sensitive high blood pressure, which means this is what that means that for fat people, when they increase, when they increase their when salt intake, it actually increases their risk of blood pressure and increase their blood pressure by about five milligrams of uh, mercury. And how does that happen? Sugar increases salt, the, 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 we already know salt, um, the relation between salt and blood pressure. So I've shown that diagram on the right through uh, plasma osmolality and then test and extra uh, cellular volume and increase, which leads to increased blood pressure. And the other one through the hypothalamus pathway. But sugar increases this salt sensitivity so that then, there's, uh, then that, is, that increases the negative effect of the sodium on blood pressure. So this people, people who, are, who have salt sensitive blood high blood pressure, Increasing their sugar intake makes um, this situation worse for them. Then for how sugar promotes obesity, that one is clear to us, we all know. So it's because sugar tastes good, 
you you like to eat more of it or drink more of it. Now, when you drink something that has sugar, it immediately raises blood pressure because it doesn't have to be digested. And like SSVs, I mean, you just drink them and then shroom into your stomach. And then uh, if you are not lucky, even the glucose will be like, absorbed in the, in the right in the mouth. So it is a rapid raiser of um, blood glucose. When blood glucose is high, body re releases insulin. Insulin lowers blood glucose. When blood sugar drops, you feel hungry, so you go for more. So what that means is that for somebody who drinks more, the, the more you drink, the more you want to drink. And this is why um, um, people who drink uh, sugar sweetened beverages are, um, have increased risk of obesity. In fact, the American um, Healthy America, Healthy Food America fact sheet shows that drinking sugary drinks regular increases 55, uh, chances of obesity among children by 55%. And chances of obesity at age six, if con consumed in infancy, by 71%. So not only in adults, but also in children. And, and I will urge you to go and look for more facts on this, because uh, uh, of course, these are the countries that have done studies that we can fall on to give us um, the facts. And they have shown the cost of um, the healthcare that is um, uh, associated with being obese and the complications that are related to obesity. So sugar promotes obesity. And, and this is also shown clearly. Consuming one can of soft drink per day could lead to 6.75 6 kg of weight in a year. And I've shown this lady on the right by different sizes, just to show how if you are increasing by 6.75 kg a year, what you can look like within four and five years. Because within four and five years, you can easily would have probably increased by 30 kilograms. 30 kilograms is enough to make you look almost one and a half your size, or if not, if not close to double your size. And so clearly, SSV consumption promotes weight gain. And we all know the repercussions of um, weight gain or overweight and obesity for NCDs. Clearly, and that was shown in the study by Ludwig. And, and, and et al, where who um, from their study showed that each additional serving of, of SSP increased BMI by 0.25 kilograms uh, just in the additional serving. So if you are having that serving every day and for every year, it makes sense that by the year you have increased almost seven kilograms of weight. And frequency of obesity is um, the odds of it increases by 1.60. And again, we can see this increased consumption of SSD was, claimed, was closely linked with a higher prevalence of obesity and metabolic syndrome in a Korean population. That's the second study by Shin et al. So clearly, obesity is a risk factor for NCD because we know how the adipocytes behave. And they increase the risk of inflammation, which increases people's risk of diabetes and cancer. And they are also associated with damage endothelia and vascular muscle, um, which can lead to cardiovascular diseases and hypertension. Of course, there are other causes like each uh, factor uh, complication like sleep apnea and infertility, which are outside the, the, the what we are talking about now. But there are also health concerns that people with overweight and obesity are likely to have. And I want to show you this diagram. It's a very, uh, I find it very fascinating because in Latin America, they have um, actually predicted what will happen to the levels of NCDs in the population if the levels of uh, overweight continue to increase. So there's a scenario on the top left. If it continues, overweight and obesity continue to increase um, by the way it's going, uh, from where it is in 2010 to 2050, where, where it will be, then on the down graph, you see on the right side how overweight, how NCDs prevalence will look like. Here, they are talking about cancers uh, and heart diseases plus stroke and diabetes. And if they were to reduce the or reverse the trend, then you see for the same countries in the left side, like Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, you see on the left side 
where the levels of these diseases are going to be much lower. So clearly you can see a commensurate effect of NCM of overweight and, and, on, and, on, and, and, on, and on NCD risk in, in, in these countries that have predicted that. And it's very important evidence that we can use to show that you know, once an overweight obesity is increasing, we can also expect NCDs to increase. Now also, overweight obesity can cause cancers. And we know that fat cells increase inflammation and, be, and make extra hormones and growth factor. I've shown that in the earlier diagram. And then the hormones, growth factors, and inflammation can cause cells to start to divide than expected. And this can increase the chance of cancers or cells becoming cancerous. And then if they continue to, to grow and they, they become a metastasis, metastasis, and to metastasize, then they can actually um, be dangerous to people. So obesity can cause cancers because of how the adipocytes um, or the fat cells behave. And by this, data evidence shows that obesity, overweight and obesity increase the risk for about 13 different cancers, including esophageal cancer, liver cancer, kidney cancer, stomach cancer, colorectal cancer, advanced prostate cancer, postmenopausal breast cancer, gallbladder cancer, pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, and, and, and endometrial cancer. And it's through the mechanism that I've shown. Obesity increasing, adipocytes increases, increasing inflammation and in extra hormones and growth factors. We can um, increase in, um, uh, the cells uh, division, and then that can lead to some of the cells becoming cancerous, and then that can lead to cancers in different parts of the body. So in ending, we know that we must be concerned about all this because SSBs are on the rise in the country. I'm showing you pictures of different parts of the country. You see them being carried on trucks, you see them, and you see them behind people's uh, pick up, uh, pick, pick up uh, cars. You see them in villages in a small tabletop with that dilapidated shop, but they have SSBs in them. Then you see them also in supermarkets where they are nicely arranged in shelves. It's actually uh, the way it's ubiquitous, isn't it? It's everywhere. And so small shops play a central role, it's not just big shops. Former retailers also promote SSBs and, and, and open markets and, and stalls and open uh, tabletops are all promoting SSBs. And that is why they are available both in rural and urban areas alike. And that is why we see overweight and obesity increasing also both in rural and urban areas alike. And our rapid study showed SSBs and biscuits were consumed mainly by a lot, not mainly a lot, by youth and women. And the, those who sell them don't know anything about nutrition. They are not nutrition, nutrition conscious. And we see there's actually an infiltration into the market of SSBs coming from all or, or in different parts of the, of the world, all into the country and being in a, like a deliberate effort to push them into the country. And they are becoming the choice that people want to make instead of uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. And so what should we do about that? It's clear from what we have shown that the level of the, the effect of SSDs on, on, on our health, it directly and then through the other metabolic risks that they pose. And so the, the healthy alternatives to SSDs, which are the, the fruits and vegetables and then the legumes, must be promoted. And how do, they, do we promote them? By subsidies on different parts of the, their value chain. So not just for production, but to prevent um, post-harvest losses and um, to promote their distribution into parts that are, they are needed much more. All that must have policy that uh, promotes them. So, so that we don't end up with some policies that promote uh, production, but then they end up in where they are produced and then they get spoiled and people don't have access to them. And when we talk about the value chain, we're talking about road infrastructure, uh, we are talking, we're talking about storage facilities, we're talking about post stores and markets and all that. There must be policies to promote these. These are the, and they are the alternatives to SSBs. But for the SSBs, just like 
the, the, the policy the WHO um, suggests. Regulation, the WHO suggests, but also our own national policy <clears throat> on preventing NCDs also reiterate that regulation, enforcement of, of policies, but also taxation. Taxation is what we are pushing for to ensure that um, these um, are curtailed. So in conclusion, we all know, we can all see that the global NCD burden is dire and nobody is left out. We know that Ghana has a double burden of malnutrition and is driven by a dysogenic food environment. We know that SSVs are sugary drinks. They are not, uh, there's no fancy name to give them. They are just sugary drinks. Their sugar levels are far above recommendations for any healthy population and for any normal population. They increase caloric intake and weight gain. They are associated with increased risk for heart diseases and other NCDs like diabetes, cancers, and others. And we know that SSB drives Ghana's obesogenic food environment is one of the key ones that they are consumed. But there are opportunities to, to curtail their impact and the opportunities to also promote um, healthier alternatives to them. And so with this, I want to thank you all very much for, um, for this rather long uh, talk, but um, I hope that you have enjoyed yourself. So thank you very much, over to you, Unix. I can see there are many chats so I don't know whether there are questions. I thought talking, I couldn't have gone to look at them, but maybe we can spend the Q&A session to also look at the comments that have been made in the chats. Over to you, Eunice. Yes. I have already said over to you. Hello. Yeah, please, are you done? Oh, sorry, I just restarted. So I'm back. A very um, insightful, insightful presentation. Thank you so much, Prof. Anand. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have questions, tons of questions for you. And um, well, I, I've put down a lot of notes. I'll reserve my questions and see what members would say. So um, I would want to ask, I don't know if you can see from the chat, because I kept going and out, I've lost the chat history. But um, Senam, are you still with us? Uh, yeah, I can see the chats. You can see, great. The prof, can you please address some? OK, so some are quite uh, to everybody. Somebody said, what are the differences or privileges attached to different gun, different types of gun membership? So that's uh, Abdella, you want to say something about that? Yeah, I think he commented earlier. Okay, so it's all addressed. So maybe let me go to where, okay. So all the things are mainly around membership. Okay, so and okay. okay, so maybe Timothy Palatong Dut said, uh, I would like to find out from Dr. Annan if it is possible for Ghana to have a glycemic index database for our locally produced foods and drinks. I will say yes. Um, but these are all supposed to be research initiatives and to drive such agenda because we need also the evidence to make policies. And if we don't have them, we cannot. We, I will also say that thankfully uh, over here at KNUSD, we have uh, we are starting setting up a center of excellence uh, called periodic table of food initiative which will be really analyzing foods for their composition of various nutrients and then non nutrients and anti nutrients and so it's a quite a big um, grant we have won to set this up and i'm sure that some of these questions that are coming up may end up being part of the things we'll do to develop the periodic uh, table of um, um, of locally produced foods with regards to their glycemic index. We did some work earlier on, on, on wow. just about six or so of them many years ago by, I think um, it was defined. And, and I know that there are many more locally produced foods and drinks that can be, we can look at their glycemic index. 
and okay, somebody was concerned about bricks, but he was now he's finished the language. That that uh, somebody told that register <laughs> attendance. Uh, uh, three minutes to wrap up. That was twenty nine, and I finished within the three minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, I, um, uh, and I also see one here. Um, it's asking about. Um, I think Dr. Perk, you may need a slice. This may take a little more time. But if I can ask the question for Alex Okra. And he says, please, Prof, when can I start giving? Wow. Thank you. Yeah, great. Um, he says that, um, when can I start giving honey to my kid who just started complimentary feeding? So not before they are two years of age, because we already know that honey actually considered sugar, considered as sugar. So and we don't say that we know that the, its metabolism is slightly different, but we don't it, we don't consider that different. And so below two years of age, no children should be given. We know children shouldn't be given any other sugar. And so please, uh, after two years, we also know not just because of the uh, the, the sugar, but we um, there's uh, there's other reasons why honey shouldn't be given beyond even the sugar. I think it promotes some. I have to check again and things like that. So it should not be given. So please wait till two years and above. Okay. Okay. There's somebody there. Somebody was. Thank you. Can you compare SSBs with the frequent use of honey? So I don't I don't know what what that is asking. Um, whether you are saying that is this be, is this better than this or not? You know when we are doing the food based dietary guidelines, there was a debate about honey because many had thought that it was a bet, it was a good replacement for sugar. But the the but the evidence shows that honey is once you are you see it is also sort of um, refined. How would I put it? Basically, what is in it is sucrose. So you have even you have glucose and fructose. So uh, we won't say it's not a complex sugar. There's no complex sugar in it. So it is still it is, you should consider it as sugar. And if you are avoiding sugar, you must also avoid honey. Thank you very much, Prof. And um, we still have I think we have a, a number of questions around honey. It looks like honey is, is trying to replace sugar in a way. So um, would you want to address whether we can replace sugar with honey or is the same quantity? That, that's what I just said that the, the, the evidence is that honey, honey is also sugar. So um, we should not say that uh, we are using it in, in, in the, in the, to replace sugar. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, Alex, Badu is asking if they can have access to your presentation. I'm adding something to the chat box for this for you to see regarding the, the honey. I want it to go to everyone. And okay. this, I mentioned it the last time we were meeting. So he says that infant botulism is caused by a toxin from Clostridium botulinum. So we know botulism caused by Clostridium botulinum bacteria, which live in the soil and dust. The bacteria can get on surfaces like carpets and floors and also can contaminate honey. That is why babies younger than one year old should never be given honey. So we are not, not even for the sugar that is in the honey, but even the fact that they are liable to um, uh, botulism from Clostridium botulinum. But the recommendation says that added sugar can only be given to children after two years of age. Thank you very much. Today has been quite insightful. Um, for me personally, I've learned a lot and we've had a very graphic um, understanding of the implication of SSBs on health and the death, Dr. I don't want to say scary. 
because it's easy to equate sugar and tension other links and worry so let's see if we have more questions okay okay how about our local drink can we classify our local drink yeah as um, i know that this question came up in our last meeting with the Ghana for hello Eunice. Oh. I'm saying that this question came up in our last presentation that, you know, that even the local drinks that are supposed to serve as alternatives, once um, we must make sure that, and then this guy talked about it, Wise talked about it, we must make sure that in their production, very little sugar is added. Because you and I know that sometimes the amount of sugar they add to so below is so high. So uh, you may say that I'm bringing a local drink, but you know, they become a sugar sweetened beverage. So it will only serve as a good alternative if very little sugar is added or no sugar is added at all, so that it will give its um, medicinal um, effects that we are drinking them for. But if you just go for the local drinks, so we know, I mean, um, what, what are their names? Pohat beer. Um, and uh -huh. stuff and so calm and all that mm -hmm. they put a lot of sugar in them and those who are on the line can testify and they couldn't be okay, so i i think that finish is having a little challenge yes so, and i so, see Sam's hand is up yeah, so there's a setup. so um what do you think we can do about that Um, Eunice, the question is not very clear. I'm not sure, Prof. Kelly. Um, we lost some of your, your voice. So let me let me just stand in for Eunice whilst uh, she resolves her network. Um, Timothy, your hand is up. Mm -hmm. Please, please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, yeah. Timothy, go ahead. Go ahead and ask your question. Timothy, unmute yourself, please. Okay. Um, I said, yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I thank Doc for his powerful presentation and very interesting. Uh, my worry is about uh, the soft drinks. It is high time that, you know, uh, the religion, especially some of the churches, they don't promote hard drinks, but they recommend soft drinks for their programs. But now that's uh, following the doctor presentation, following the, doc the doctor presentation, we have seen that some of the soft drinks, almost 90% are highly concentrated in terms of sugar. So, meaning that this gun, our program gun, is very interesting. That we have to educate our people that there is a danger lying behind. If you think that you are not there for hard drink and you are concentrating on soft drinks, then you should consume it moderately. If not, in coming years, we will be suffering more than America when we are talking of uh, obesity. Some of us are working at the periphery. You'll be surprised uh, that uh, sometimes we meet people who are suffering from diabetes and you'll be shocked. So the double burden that Doc has, talk, has spoken about it, me, I would have even said, said we are going to triple burden. The micronutrients is also a key factor that we are, we are meeting in our daily activities at the periphery. So I think the gun we have to stand up and work educate our people so that if not, it's a good program and uh, I, must, uh, I must sincerely appreciate it and uh, we have to work hard so that it will be a successful one. Thank you very much. It was All just right. a contribution. Thank, thank, thank you very much, um, Timothy. Um, there, is, there is a hand. Prof, you want to respond to that? Prof, okay. 
Yes, right. Just add quickly that many people think, especially those who don't drink uh, alcoholic drinks, they think that because they are doing they are drinking soft drinks, they are they are better off. And those who are drinking alcoholic drinks are worse off. But I think that uh, from what we are learning, SSB's soft drinks are as uh, harmful as alcoholic drinks. If I mean, in quotes, I'm not uh, just uh, uh, spoiling anybody's market, but what I'm saying that they are also harmful. So if you used to drink alcoholic drinks and you have stopped, don't say that now, nah, don't drink alcohol, I drink soft drinks, I'm better off. Because you've been drinking so much sugar and you are increasing your risk for metabolic sense. Somebody said, what I should show, I should um, show again the relationship between um, the SSBs and metabolic syndrome. So we know SSBs um, of increase your risk for obesity. And then we also know, I talked about the inflammation that has to with hyperglycemia and then dyslipidemia. And then we also know, so uh, obesity is also associated with, uh, can be abdominal obesity. Then we know metabolic syndrome is uh, having um, uh, which one, one, about three overweight with three, two other of the cardiometabolic risk. So basically, it's the same uh, association that it increases your risk for obesity and increases your risk for these other cardiometabolic diseases risk that would overall increase your risk for metabolic syndrome by the definition of metabolic syndrome. Okay, so um, I think there's one final hand up. Emmanuel, Oman. Omari. The name oh, is Omari. Omari, apologies. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I have been following the presentation closely, and I must say it was a, it's a very good one. And uh, for me, I think uh, what I'm going to say is a contribution, though. Uh, it has to do with the SSBs. If you go out there and you talk to people, even the educated uh, individuals who know the consequences of taking these products still do take them. So I think what uh, Gand and other stakeholders in this um, 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 fight against SSB should do is that, as Prof. Elia mentioned, the fight should mainly focus on uh, taxation and importation of these products and how they get into our shops and end up in our stomachs causing all these problems. So what we should all collaborate and do is uh, uh, fight against the, 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 the taxation and uh, uh, importation of these products so that even those who know the consequences and are taking them would also be saved from this epidemic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emmanuel. You know, that's why I presented on the upstream factors, which are the societal and policy factors that also affect what food is available for people to consume. So what we are saying is that even though people need to be educated to choose healthy food, we, also address, then we must also address the physical food environment to limit access to unhealthy food, <clears throat> make them more inaccessible, accessible, make them more unavailable, make them more unaffordable, so that it will reduce their consumption overall. And so that's one of the ways to go. You know, addressing the physical food environment is one of the, the strongest um, um, nutrition interventions that can be implemented to promote health in a population. Okay, so Prof, there are a few comments in the, in the chat. Let me just highlight them. Uh, so the, the first one is how do we highlight the effect of hidden sugar in other foods such as tomato paste? A, a gram of 100 gram of tomato paste may have up to 12 grams of, of sugar. I would say that we, you know, we must always start from somewhere, isn't it? Sure. Uh, there are maybe if it's sugar we are addressing, sugar is everywhere, but we can start from SSP, sugar sweetened mm -hmm. beverage. Mm -hmm. And if we are able to address that menace, we can push to other areas where we sugar is also contained. 
But for all you know, maybe the amount of sugar in some of these other products are not as high as the SSBs. The, the reason why everybody is on SSBs, the whole wide world, is because really the sugar levels are high. It's so amazing. I mean, to pick one small bottle of a soda or a carbonated drink and be drinking nine, um, nine cubes of sugar, it's, it's beyond um, imagination. And that's why the focus is on them. But we are not saying that the only way, that's the only place the fight is. We must start from somewhere anyway, and then eventually uh, take the fight to other um, unhealthy food. That well said, Pro. I, I think the final two posts. Um, if children below two years should should not have added sugar, what happens to children with some who take RUTF that is pumping nuts that contains so much sugar? It's a very good question. And I would say that maybe in the formulation of plumping nuts, and we are talking about malnourished children, and so um, and we know that they also require a certain amount of energy. And so in the formulation, I, I should think that these considerations have been made, have been taken into, into account in formulating SF, uh, plumping nut. But also some of these things open our eyes to maybe what is out there that eventually we must also address. And so I would not, uh, and they're about to say that, look, um, there are different areas that the fight might be taken to. And when we get to that point, all these areas will have to be addressed. Well, well said. And I, just to add that um, plumping nuts is therapeutic food. And so therapeutic foods, like you said, are for the purposes of therapy. And so the sugars in plumping nuts are there for the purpose of therapy. Yeah. And so unless they are beyond the therapeutic levels, we can consider them therapeutic for the purpose of, of dealing with the, with the children with sound. But here we are talking about people who are not sick, who have access to SSBs and they take it at will. And that's the that's a two different conversations. All right. Um, so Prof, any final comments? I think that we've covered, covered most of the things. And we can yeah, add so so let, uh, before I made a final comment, let me just address Abdullah Abdul Rao's uh, comment that. In fact, what surprises me is that we seem to quickly relegate our sugar drinks to the level that uh, a lot of uh, serious occasions don't like to use. How much could, could be also? I'm thinking that, like we've said, the local alternatives are good, but they may also be um, likely have high levels of sugar. So once we are making the alternatives, we must make sure that they also don't become sugar sweetened in the way that these SSVs are that we are already talking about. If not, you may find that they even may have more sugar than beverages. And so um, somebody can sleep right. We should be not consume SSVs at all, or should we consume in moderation? Please, this question should be addressed. Uh, I think that I think it's a good question, basically. And you know, I showed you the recommendations for other sugar. And if you look at that, those recommendations, you will see that you and I as adults, there's a certain amount of grams or in teaspoons or in cubes that is required. So if you pick an SSB, you must ask yourself, this one SSB, does it have more than the requirement? If you have more than the requirement, then you cannot. If half of it will meet the requirement, then you bring just half. But if you also, you and I know that if 350 mil of an SSB, it, which a cola drink has more than your requirements, then and it's, they almost become something you must avoid. And, be, and, and of course, if they are reformulated to then meet the sugar requirement, which can be done, if they are reformulated to meet the sugar requirement, then of course, they are fine. And some know that some of the cola drinks have sugar, no other sugar version. But we also want to be sure that the kinds of replacers, sugar replacers that have been used are not equally unhealthy. So one, one of those, we are not saying they should be completely banned. We are saying that they must meet a requirement of not being loaded with sugar so that people can drink them 
and bring them safely. And so um, if there are laws that say that if you go beyond this level, then we put a, a tax, then people can reformulate their products to make sure that they meet those requirements such that they are not beyond the levels that are considered healthy and for which reason a tax is um, advocated. And, and that's what I will say. And, and uh, so as last word, I will say, I think that the discussion continues, uh, Percy. And so it's not a last word per se, but we all have to uh, be on board to push this agenda for health projects. Um, and beyond it, we must be advocates and for our own families and all. When I go to my family house, in the extended family house, I see all the young women who now say, now we don't drink alcohol, we drink soft drinks, but you see them drinking several of them, three, four, and things like that. And I feel that, tell them, I know that, you don't just feel, I tell them that, look, it is not a good alternative. You are as worse as when you were drinking alcohol. So if you are going for soft drinks, limit your intake, make sure that you go for the ones that don't have sugar and, and be careful. Don't just console yourself that I drink soft drinks, so I am fine. So on that note, I will say that my last word is that the, the, the discussion goes on. Thank you so very much, Prof. 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 And I mean, I think we deserve a very loud round of applause. People, let's 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 clap for Prof. Let's use the the. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, it's been it's been a very exciting engagement. I I I'm sure if we allow an extra thirty minutes, we will still have a lot to talk about. Um, but we must we must end soon. Um. Uh, I'm standing in for, for Eunice. I think she's having a little challenge. So, guys, um, I want to welcome the president to give a few words. And then after which the secretary will give a few announcements. And then we should be out here in no more than five minutes after six. Let's go. Over to you, sir. Presdo. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Good. Yeah. Good evening. To all again, Good um, I think uh, Prof. Uh, Anand has done us a lot of good, and uh, he has tactfully addressed almost all the questions that that came up uh, to him. Um, what is important that we need here is the take-home messages that came from this very interesting presentation. Gant now is part of the coalition that is pushing for a physical policy on SSBs. And that is, as I've said earlier, towards our own vision of driving change in the Ghanaian food environment and ensuring that the best comes to Ghanaians. And so all of us who have listened to this presentation, it's something for you to carry along in your respective regions that you find yourself, that we are all involved in this fight against SSB. It could save your mother, it could save your child, it could save your your, your grandchild or anybody at all, your friends and acquaintances, it could save them. One thing that we don't know, and I think Prof. Anand made it very clear to us that, you see, I don't drink beer, but I drink, uh, uh, um, 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 uh, I drink, I take soft drinks, so I'm safe. We are all not safe in this kind of thing, looking at the production that we have. I said that in my last this thing, the, the, the last time we checked, using the guidelines for healthier foods options, we found that almost about 90% of the food juices or what we call uh, SSBs that we have, even, even among the various ones that they say pure fruit juice and all that, you could realize that the sugar content of it is so, so, so unhealthy. So it's something that is for all of us, uh, food for thought for all of us to, to go. Um, another important issue that has come up, and I'm sure that is why um, Della wants me to <laughs> say something, but I, uh, he would be in the position to talk about it because he represented us at the um, at the um, Allied Health uh, uh, Federation of uh, Presidents. And uh, very soon you'll be getting some circulars that is going to give certain instructions as to how we are going to carry our activities with the Allied Health Council.
from today until further notice. And the whole issue is about the fact that the council is not actually helping the professions that are under them in the sense that a lot of decisions have been taken without due consultations with the professions that are under the council. And we think it is time for us to put our foot down on many of these issues to correct the system that is becoming gradually becoming incorrect. Uh, you and I must be very, very focused in this fight because it is something that is going to change the face of the council's activity. And we as GAN are standing very, very high or very tall with the, uh, our other colleagues from the other federation uh, to push until something right happens. One of the key issues I'll just touch on the surface and I'm sure Dela would, would let you know is the issue of the, um, uh, the new registration and licensing rates that have come. No discussions were done with the federations with the, with, the, with the professions that are under them. And if you compare what we are even to pay in our licensing and all that, you realize that even professions that in Ghana, we know that are being paid better than we are paid, even pay less for their registration of licenses. And I think this, is, this kind of suppression cannot go on uh, uh, and we need to quench it. So we are just pleading that you listen to uh, Dela uh, 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 in a moment, and then when you get these circulars, let us all unite and ensure that we are not operated under oppressors' roof. And uh, it's a very important fight that, besides fighting for sugar, for 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 a good fiscal policy to control our health environment, um, our food environment, we are also fighting to ensure that we have a be beautiful and a better futures future as a professionals of nutrition. So thank you very much, uh, Prof. Anand, uh, for this very, in fact, <laughs> I, I, I just felt like, yes, this is a, this is a full lecture. <laughs> and uh, uh, going through the mechanism of uh, the, the sugar and all that, this message is, this is how we professionals need, what we professionals need to equip ourselves uh, to talk about SSBs anywhere and anytime we find ourselves, anywhere we find ourselves, to be confident of what we know about SSBs and the fact that we would want to have a physical policy to address this issue. So thank you very much, Professor uh, for making uh, us proud with such wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, members, you should uh, expect more of such uh, insightful presentations coming up uh, that will be flowing along the years. Um, so if, if you are also a researcher, a writer, uh, somebody in service, and you have found something interesting in nutrition that you want to share with us, uh, there is this presidential initiative, special initiative to actually promote the sharing of very uh, important evidence through our platform. And so if you get in touch with Dela or any of the uh, GB members, we will note and then see how when we form the list for different presenters in various, uh, in the years to come or in the near future, uh, you will also have the opportunity to give us uh, such wonderful uh, um, and news. So Dela, please over to you and, uh, uh, and thank you all for, for, for making it. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. President. I, I think you have effectively pushed the conversation back to me, but, but then the, you, you equally, effectively address the key issues. Colleagues, the allied health is, en is enjoined by the, by the constitution to make suggestions for how much, what we call the fees and charges. They make suggestions, it goes through the processes to the ministries of finance and, and the health, it gets to parliament, parliament approves it. For some strange reason, last year we were paying more for particularly some, some particular services, including and that's how come we, we ended up paying a little more than we paid the previous year for our you know, renewals. But what is happening is that there are other things, including verification of, of certificates, particularly if you train from outside and you came to Ghana, you're going to pay the next set of $600 just to verify your certificate. Or if you decide that you want to, to go for further studies and, and your university outside request for, 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 to, to, to verify whether you were, you were a practitioner in Ghana, you are paying in excess of $600. That was for 
this year, 2022. And we had issues with that. We raised that with the, with the council as far back as February. And for some strange reason, we've not been able to, we've not gone far with the, with the council. We got, it took six months to, to schedule a meeting. And after the meeting, nothing changed. And all of a sudden, this year, for next year, 2023, parliament has already approved new charges, which is supposed to be between uh, 15 and 25% increment across board. And when you do the calculations, ours is around 27% increment. That means that Allied Health is paying is already paying more, and we are now going to pay up to 27% more for the same services that other councils like the NDC and the nursing council will pay, which is not very good. We are not we are the youngest professions or councils. We cannot be, be doling out so much money for services that others are getting for for for, for very minimal rates. And we think that it's not fair to us. So we, so the Federation, which is the body of all allied health professionals have come together and we are making a strong statement. I've seen that somebody has already put the Federation's post on the Telegram page. Uh, please look out for the grant um, support for that, for that publication. And the idea is that everybody should take action and follow it. That does not mean, let me clarify, that you will not participate in grant activities. For, the, for all the weeks until December, we have CPD activities organized. The idea is that you will continue to observe GAN activities until GAN says stop, because we need to get the CPD points in readiness. If we're able to resolve this before December, then we can all use the points we've amassed to renew our licenses. Otherwise, like I said, the professional body is, is giving corporate protection and legal protection to each one of us. So all you need to do is to stand with the grant and you are and you are covered. Thank you very much. Um, Secretary, over to you, madam. Then we can wrap up. Thank you very much, Stella and everyone. Um, some few announcements before we go. As um, Stella has already um, stated, there are some CPDs on every week till, till December. So next week, we are meeting again on first 26th at 2 p.m. with a presentation from the middle zone. The flyers will be out soon, so please watch out for, for, for that. Um, I just also want to remind us to please visit the GAND website to register as members, and also we should pay our dues. And for those of us who were in the World Food Day Symposium and those of us in today's CPD, the certificates will be worked on and are being worked on. We are quite a number, so we, we are ensuring that everyone is, um, everyone's certificate is worked on. So please be patient with us. We'll get your certificates to you in due time and it will be before you have to renew your your pin yes so that is all for me with regards to announcements thank you for joining us and see you next week thank you thank you. thank you thank you thank you very much bye so let's just say a quick prayer bye. thank you lord for an oh for yes thank you meeting. Uh, we, we know that you've, it has been very fruitful. Bring us back here next week for the next one in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you all for coming. And thank you. Yes. Thank you, Eunice. Thank for, you. For wonderful work done. Bye. Bye. Yeah, thank you for having me. Bye. Bye. Bless you. Bless you. Bye. Bye. Uh, Please, if you haven't filled the Google form, please in the chat. Kindly do so before you log off.